Boston.com. Tonight on Greater Boston, Massachusetts Congressman Seth Moulton, just back from a second trip to Ukraine, his first since Russia's invasion. He joins me on what he saw, what he thinks the U.S. should be doing now, and the wider danger that would come from a Russian victory in this war. We'll also discuss the United States abandoning those who never abandon us in Afghanistan. Then later, award-winning local restaurant tours, Tiffany Faison and Ken Oranger here, along with a little food, of course, to talk about how they managed to make it out of lockdowns and open new restaurants along the way. <music> Nearly 10 months into Russia's invasion of Ukraine, as troops head into their second winter of battle, both sides are vowing to fight on. While Ukrainian President Zelensky is calling on Russian troops to withdraw by Christmas, the Kremlin is calling on Ukraine to, quote, take into account the realities that have developed. Although for the first time since 2013, Putin has canceled his annual year-end news conference, so I guess we won't hear the details of those realities from him. But I'm assuming he means the ones facing millions of Ukrainians worried about being left in the dark without heat or hot water in the coldest months, thanks to his constant attacks on critical civilian infrastructure. Massachusetts Congressman Seth Moulton was among a group of five lawmakers from both parties who recently got a first-hand look at the situation on the ground in Kiev. Congressman Moulton joins me now. Congressman, good to see you. Thanks so much. Good to see you too, Jim. When you were there about a year ago, you came back and said the U.S. was way behind in doing what it had to do to deter a Russian invasion. Obviously, you were right. Uh, how are we doing now and how are the Ukrainians doing now? Well, the Ukrainians are doing incredibly well. I mean, nobody expected them to be actually winning this war against Russia and defeating Putin in his march westward is an incredibly important victory, not just for Ukraine, but for us as well. There's one lesson we should have learned over the last 15 years. It's that Putin's not going to stop. He's going to keep going. We expect him to stop after Georgia, then after Crimea. We can't expect him to stop after Ukraine if he somehow convinces himself that he gets a win here. So he has to be defeated. The Ukrainians are doing that, and it's thanks to our help. Our help's been incredible. And although the administration was slow to act at first, I think they've run this war effort quite brilliantly over most of the last eight months. My one complaint is they're still just a little bit slow. Uh, we talked with the Ukrainians about getting them Patriot missiles, for example. It's taken weeks. The administration finally just That's made about that to happen, right? Point. Okay, I'm sorry. Yeah, that is about to happen, right? That's right. We it's taken too long, Jim, but they are approved, and, uh, and that will make a big difference in stopping these Russian attacks on critical infrastructure. If Putin's trying to use winter as a weapon, personally, I don't think it's going to work. I think the Ukrainians are far more resilient than he thinks. But it's still going to be a tough winter, and make no mistake, this is an absolutely brutal war. I want to get back to their resiliency in a minute, but stay on the U.S. support. Other than these Patriot missiles, are there other things we should be doing that we are not? And when I say we, I don't just mean the United States. I mean our Western allies, because it seems to me that President Biden has done a pretty good job of holding them together. He has done a remarkable job of building this coalition and, and then keeping it together. And we're doing a lot. Of course, there's always more that we can do. But I think the biggest thing is we've just got to get them aid quickly. One of the things about this war is the Ukrainians' needs change over time. If you remember when it started, it was all about Stinger missiles to keep Russian warplanes out of the sky. Those were successful. Then it was about getting the right kind of artillery to push back the Russian lines. Now it's about Patriot missiles to knock down these Russian cruise missiles. One of the questions I had for the Ukrainians was, what will you need three months from now, six months from now? Those are the kinds of questions that we need to be asking to make sure we're anticipating their needs and we can ultimately support a Ukrainian victory. You know, uh, I was about to say to you that it's easy for someone like me who sits on his couch and watches television at night and nod my head and say, I can't believe how brave and, and relentless the Ukrainian people are. You bring a little more credibility to the table. I'm sure most people know four tours of duty in Iraq. But it seems to me that spirit is one thing. Freezing cold winters with, with, as I said, no hot water, no heat for a ton of people, as Putin is focused on the electric grid, that infrastructure, is pretty tough even for people with great resolve, is it not? It is. And this is going to be a tough winter for Ukraine. But I tell you, I've just been so impressed 
by their resiliency, by their resolve. One of the most shocking things to me about visiting the Capitol this month, exactly a year after I was there, just before the invasion started, is how much it's the same. Kiev is still a functioning city. You wouldn't know that there's a war going on uh, in the country because the people have so much resolve. It, it must have been like London during the Great Blitz, uh, uh, when um, when you know when they just refused to be cowed by by Hitler. And in fact, I'll, I'll take the opportunity to say there are a lot of comparisons being made in Ukraine today between Putin and Hitler. I think that's how Putin is going to go down in history. You know, uh, Seth Moulton, can we talk about our resolve? Uh, your Republican colleagues in the House who are about to take uh, control are less enthusiastic, it seems to me, about full support. And so are the American people. I mean, I'm sure you've seen this poll. Let me put it up. The Quincy Institute poll from September, likely U.S. voters. Do you support the U.S. pursuing negotiations to end the war, even if Ukraine would have to make some compromise? 57 to 32. And you know as well as I, we all heard the incredible first lady of Ukraine on 60 Minutes saying no compromise at this point. Her husband, the president, saying no compromise. That 57 to 32 sounds to me like a, a people, American people, who are losing their resolve. Do you disagree with that? Well, I think that we probably need to do a, a better job of, of helping people understand the consequences of Russia somehow getting a win out of this. What war. are they? That they'll go somewhere next. And the next places that they'll go are NATO allies, because that's what borders Ukraine. And if they're attacking NATO allies like Poland, uh, where where we flew into in order to take an overnight train to mm -hmm. Kyiv, the capital of Ukraine, if they attack Poland, U.S. troops will be involved in that fight. Americans will die. So the investment that we're making in this war now will ultimately save dollars and save lives, American dollars, American do uh, lives down the road. Yeah, but it seems to me you don't only have to make, we not only have to, don't have to make the case to the American people, as I said, the Republican leadership uh, appears to be not wildly enthusiastic about this level of support. Even your colleagues, the Progressive Caucus, put out that letter, which they withdrew, the Democrats, in about a nanosecond, talking about negotiating directly, the United States negotiating directly with the Russians. So it seems to me, before we worry about educating the American people, a lot of educating of your colleagues on both sides of the aisle needs to go on. You're right. You're right, Jim, honestly. Uh, there's education that needs to go on in Congress. But it's important to understand that the vast majority of Congress, the vast majority of Republicans and Democrats support Ukraine, support them getting a victory out of this war. It's the far left and the far uh, far right, uh, really the fringes of both parties uh, that are the problem here. And uh, the progressives were very quick to withdraw that letter on, on the left. On the right, people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, they're doubling down. I don't think the issue is that Republican leadership really wants to listen to Marjorie Taylor Greene, but the political reality is that they are. And that's the concern that I have. Not that someone like Kevin McCarthy, if he becomes speaker, really wants to stop aid to Ukraine, but that he might be cowed by the far right in his party to do their bidding. And they, of course, are opposed. So we do have some work to do in Congress, but the vast majority of Congress is with Ukraine and the Ukrainian people. You know, Seth Moulton, I, I, every single person who has some expertise in this part of the world has said to me, of all political stripes, this only ends when Putin ends. Do you feel any differently? I, I think there's probably some truth to that. Um, I, uh, I, you know, I can't predict the future, but one of the most pressing questions that we're all asking is exactly how does this end? You know, what does it look like when this is all over? What does defeat for Russia actually look like on the ground? The reality right now is that neither side is in a, is, is in a position to negotiate because there's no overlap between their negotiating positions. So R Ukraine rightly says they want their country back. Uh, I don't think that if Putin were invading America, uh, we would settle for just giving up the East Coast or just giving up California in some negotiated settlement. Ukraine wants their whole country back and they deserve it. Of course, Putin, on the other hand, is wildly delusional about what he thinks he's going to get out of Ukraine. I think the way to get to a point where you could actually have a negotiation to win this to end this war is to press Ukraine uh, further on, on victory, to have the Ukrainians 
take more territory of their own back from Russia to put Russia in a more reasonable negotiating position. Can we move from Ukraine to uh, Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. We made promises, we as a country, to those who helped us in Afghanistan when we were there. My understanding is there are tens of thousands. I think most recently I saw 73,000 people after we uh, withdrew who came to this country who incredibly to me are at risk of deportation back to a country where I assume, should it happen, they're facing near certain death. Can you describe the current situation and what's going on? I mean, you're, you're telling the story exactly right, Jim, and it's despicable. Uh, we left a lot of Afghans behind. There are a lot of Afghans, tens of thousands, that we promised to save who are still in Afghanistan trying to get out. So that should be the first priority, yeah. is to get them before the Taliban gets them. But unbelievably, even the ones who we did get to safety here in America are now facing getting sent back to Afghanistan because the Republicans in Congress are blocking the effort, the effort that's bipartisan among veterans to give them their rightful future in America. This is breaking a promise that all of us who fought in these wars made to our allies, to our friends who put their lives on the line, not just for Afghanistan or Iraq, but for us too. And because we're breaking that promise that we made, it honestly feels like a real betrayal. I mean, I think for, for veterans like myself, it, it feels like we're betraying our Afghan allies because our own government is betraying us. Well, I would go further, Congressman. I would say we're not only betraying our Afghan allies, but we're betraying uh, people like you in the future who choose to fight on behalf of this country because I'm assuming that that interpreter, that aide in three years in some other uh, combat zone is gonna be less likely to put his or her family at risk by helping us when they know that the country they help is unlikely to honor our commitment to them, yes? That's exactly right. So we, we veterans feel like we're letting our allies down. We feel like we're being betrayed by today's US government. But future servicemen and women in conflicts that we don't know yet, they're gonna have to find friends and allies too. And it's gonna be really hard when they go out and say, we saw what happened. We saw what happened in Afghanistan when you promised to save your allies. You do not hold that promise, so we're not gonna work with you. And that will cost American lives. You know, I have to say, I don't understand this. My understanding is, correct me if I'm wrong, is the National Defense Authorization usually includes these extension of visas in these kind of circumstances. What is the public argument or private argument amongst the Republicans for not honoring our commitment to those who honored their commitment to us? Their argument is that they just don't like immigration. They don't like Afghans moving to America. And the chief, the, chief, uh, the chief of this argument is Chuck Grassley, Senator Grassley of Iowa, who is anti-immigrant. He's not a veteran, so he doesn't understand what it means to be in a situation where you promise someone with your life. They're putting their life in your hands, you're putting your life in theirs, and you will have their back. He doesn't understand that. And frankly, frankly Jim, I think it's right rooted in racism. I think that's what's going on here. And it's just such a shame that a few racist Republicans are breaking the promises that thousands of American veterans made to our friends. Are you confident that some version of this, whether it's tied to the defense authorization or not, is gonna pass in time to protect those who are here to at least extend their stay? I'm honestly not. Not? And I'm, and I'm doing everything I can. <laughs> Uh, with my fellow veterans, I'm, again, on both sides of the aisle, Republican veterans are with us too here. We're doing everything we can. But to be honest, right now it looks pretty bleak. Can we end on something that's a bleak situation where I think there's a little bit of good news and you're involved? Can you describe to people what this 988 lifeline is, hotline is, and how it's working since it went into place, I think, earlier this summer? So this is a bill I passed a couple years ago with a fellow veteran, a Republican on the other side of the aisle, to establish a three-digit nationwide mental health hotline to work just like 911. Yeah. You wake up in the middle of the night and your house is on fire, you dial 911, 
Now everyone will know that if you wake up and you or a loved one has a, meta, a, a, a mental health emergency, you can call 988. Since it went into effect this July, calls to the service have gone up over 40%. And something like over 80% are calls where a life is saved just by talking to someone. So this is saving thousands of lives a month. I, I, Jim, I think it's honestly the most meaningful thing that I've done uh, thus far in Congress. And, you know, it's just, it's making a difference. It's making a difference in people's lives because they know how to, they know who, a number to call. And I think it's also just normalizing the conversation about mental health. So I appreciate you bringing it up and I appreciate every opportunity I get to just talk about it so people know 988 is out there if you need it. And, and to be clear, a lot of the people who are making those calls and whose lives are being saved are fellow veterans of yours, no? There are, there's a good number that are fellow veterans and there's a real effort made if you call 988 to get directed to someone who understands your particular needs. So if you're a veteran, you'll uh, be directed to uh, an existing veterans crisis line to talk with someone who understands your particular situation uh, as, as, as best as possible. But um, it doesn't, you know, whether you're a veteran or you're someone who's just going through trauma, I think yeah. every one of us experiences trauma in some form in our lives and you deserve to get help. If you sprain your ankle, you deserve to get help. If you have a mental injury, you deserve to get help too. So call 988 if you need it. Terrific. Congressman, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Be well. It's great to see you, Jim, and you we're going to miss you. So thank you. It's thank it's you. an honor to be back on the show, and uh, I'll miss coming on with you. Tune, so on to, tune into the radio. I'll be there, Seth Moulton. Thanks okay. so much. Bye-bye. As we know, the pandemic has forced many businesses to regroup and reimagine at least those which survived. I'm joined by two of the chef owners survivors who actually expanded. Winner of the Food Network's Tournament of Champions, four times James Beard Award finalist, and 2016 Boston Magazine Best Chef Tiffany Faison, who you may know from a wildly popular Fool's Earn and Sweet Cheeks Q, and has managed to open four new places over the past year, the latest the second location for her hit Tenderonis, which lives where Faison's Southeast Asian restaurant Tiger Mama once did in the Fenway. Also joined by James Beard Award winner Ken Oranger, who, along with fellow chef owner Jamie Bissonette, is known for Copa, Toro, and Little Donkey, and just a few months back, opened uh, fa uh, Faccia a uh, Faccia. It had a different name for a while. That's why I stopped there. And Bar Polino, that I can say on Newbury Street. It's great to see you both. How are you? Good to see you too. Good. Jim, so, good in you. anticipation of you coming, I'm saying to myself, okay, I'm a restaurateur in the middle of a pandemic when my friends have had to close down restaurants. You actually had to close one, did. Great Orfanos. And I'm sitting in a room, I'm saying, I've got a great idea. Why don't I open a new restaurant <laughs> or a bunch of. I'm serious. <laughs> what is this? I mean, it was a timing kind of. You know, nobody expected the pandemic to last that long. I mean, we had a restaurant kind of in the works, in its, uh, you oh, know. Oh, even before, you're saying. Yeah, in okay. its incubation period. And we could have pulled out of it, but then we decided to uh, kind of go through it and spend double the money <laughs> and, uh, you know, and take twice as long to build it. But, here but we you go. weren't, you didn't have that deal. You had the, the open this tenderoni thing, what's it called? High Street, High Street Mall, Place. which is where I've been. I've been to your restaurant, I've been yep. to High Street, I haven't been to your new location yep. in the Fenway. So yours was a different thing, but you suffered through the pain of closing that great Orfano's, yeah. which I assume was in part because of the pandemic. So wasn't the trepidation even higher in your sure. case? It's always, I mean, it's always really high. It also but even more, no? Yeah, of course. I mean, I don't think that you, tigers don't change their stripes. At some point, I think if you're a Tiger restaurant, mamas do, though. Do you know what I mean? That's fair. Oh, look at you. Much. Look at you. I'll be in the lounge on Thursday oh, if you're my both gosh. available. Try Thank the you. veal. Go ahead. Um, <laughs> you know, I think it's, um, I think we are sort of naturally who we are as people, which is inherent risk takers. I don't think that you become a restaurateur or a chef, frankly, without being willing to, like, shoulder a good amount of risk. Can you describe briefly your place for those who haven't Tenderonis? been here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's wild. It's um, it's a lot of fun. It's kind of like this um, almost 70s, 80s inspired roller rink-ish. Um, you don't have to roller skate to your seat, oh, do you? Don't. Oh, that would please okay, don't. Please don't. <laughs> that would be amazing. There are roller clear. skates in the room, okay. but no, please don't roller skate in the restaurant. So what's the deal? What's the basic uh, thing? Tons of pizza, lots of fun, like Italian uh, salads, a lot of uh, quick bites. Like It's just it's a really fun kind of Italian-ish style restaurant. Okay, Wait, so Tiffany, what is this? This is pistachio cake. Okay. Well, let's like start it. with dessert. As Joanne Chang would say, eat back. You right? push that in my direction, sure. please. Yeah, this what is, is that again? Uh, we call this known as pistachio cake. So um, this is 
D. Stephen Chin, who is uh, my Tiffany, patient. you don't mind if I have a bite, right? I don't have a fork, yeah. but Oh, my um, God. Yes, fine. you do. Here you it's go. It's wild. Um, he brought the fork. Sure. This is a really good example oh my God. of what I want tenderness to be. I want it to be wildly delicious, unabashedly fun. I want us to, like, we take our, our job seriously. We don't take ourselves seriously. So I want that to be really clear when people come into the restaurant. So describe your uh, place on uh, Newbury Street. We try to change his name because somebody in Brooklyn, <laughs> something or other, whatever. Okay. So Faccia Faccia is basically a coastal Italian restaurant with, uh, dictated by the farmer's market. Uh, we also have Bar Polino downstairs, which is a natural wine bar, lots of small plates, and just vinyl playing pretty much uh, all night. Really fun, funky vibe. But it's at Newberry Street. We want to be a neighborhood restaurant, and that's what all our restaurants have been successful as neighborhood restaurants. And when you think about Newberry Street, you're like, why aren't there more neighborhood restaurants? Mm -hmm. You know, Sansi's been there forever. Yeah. And Contessa opened up, and you know, it's an amazing, amazing restaurant. But there's so many people living in the back bay now, and um, you know, with Uni and Cleo for so long, you know, I've walked those streets for 20 something years. I was like, man, there should be more neighborhood restaurants on Newberry Street. Mm -hmm. So, what you brought that thing. Hey, can you push that over here, please? So this I is, hear it goes great with pistachio cake. <laughs> I mean, it just did. What is, what is this thing? So this is uh, called it's Mafalde. It's a handmade. We make all our own pastas. Jesus. And we make gluten-free pastas That's as well. Yeah. And this is in season now. This is mm. uh, chingiale ragu. So it's Mont wild boar ragu. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's wild boar that's been cooked with wow. cocoa and red wine and porcini mushrooms and allspice and just all those warming kind of uh, Starbucks, um, you know, pumpkin spicy type things. What is there, Starbucks? <laughs> oh, someone else speaking with their mouth full. So are pe like have people you. shed their fears about sitting in, I mean, when I was there, it was outside, right, on the street. Uh, are people, have they gotten over their anxiety about being inside? Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like night and day. I mean, Because of all the pent-up demand? or Is that what it is or what is no, it? No, actually, it's funny because now, I mean, the city has changed so much between last year. Like, the other night it was like, I don't know, 45 degrees outside. And we couldn't beg a person to eat on the patio. Where a year ago, you know, we were having 50, 60, 70 people sit on the patio, you know, every night. And they would just... Bundle up and uh, and deal with it and have a great time. Are you experiencing the same deal? Same yeah, thing? I think people are back. There is an inevitability of just people want their lives to move on. And I think there's still some trepidation. Like, there's people that are, are cautious. Um, I understand that a little bit. But I just think that you can only go for so long as a human without being around other humans and experiencing Are your workers comfortable? I mean, are your servers and other mm -hmm. workers comfortable? Are yours? Absolutely. Yeah. Especially holiday time, too. Again, mm -hmm. people just want the excuse to be together mm -hmm. and make up for lost time. Yeah. Okay, so that's obviously broccoli pizza. I mean, duh. I, I'm going to taste you this. You sure can. Don't ever say duh with Tiffany. You never know. I mean, <laughs> it might fair. look like broccoli, but she might shape like, you know, burrata into uh, broccoli <laughs> stems broccoli or something. Stems. So um, you never know. Yeah, go ahead. What, broccoli fonduta, so like a fontina, broccoli fonduta on the bottom, um, a little bit oh, more mozz and pecorino. Uh, broccoli. Why isn't he eating that? Oh, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, all right. Go. You insist. Uh, yeah. uh, broccoli with like a, and then a raw broccoli salad on top with pecorino. But Jim, I don't want to get broccoli in my teeth on TV. This was radio. A trap, Ken. So this yeah. is in keeping with the green theme, as Ken was saying before we started. What kind of pizza is this deal? Jardiner. So this is a vodka-based oh, sauce, really so like really oh. creamy and delicious. Um, our own house-made Jardiner on top, a uh, good amount of fontina mozzarella, and then finish with parsley. It's great putting it on your notes when you're doing an interview, well, too. You know, what do you think of that? It's like salad. Delicious, yeah. <laughs> what is with the long just rectangle? Just right cheesy enough, it's delicious. Thank you. What's the rectangle thing? Um, the rectangle is really just like designed so that you get my, for me, the perfect pizza is a good amount of crunch, that fattiness, and then I want burnt cheese on literally everything. Yeah. So the idea is that every piece gets that like burnt cheese crust. You know, I know this is a close knit community. I mean, the restaurateurs. I know you're so all of both of you are, and all of you have pretty strong bonds with everybody else doing their their thing. Do most of you feel local, state, federal governments did enough to get you and your colleagues through this nightmare, or no? Oh, no way. I mean, we saw. It. Thousands and thousands of restaurants closing, you know, everywhere, and in, you know, in Boston, all over the state. I mean, we have so. I mean, Tiffany. I mean, you know, we know so many people that closed. They were waiting and waiting and waiting for help, mm -hmm. and it took forever. And the RRF was a disaster. You know, some people got restaurant way too much. Yeah, some people got way too much yeah. money. 
that didn't need it, and then you know the small time people that couldn't get their paperwork together got nothing. Yeah. And uh, you know it's really horrible. It Is that was, your take too? I think it was really tough for like very small restaurants yeah. that you know if you're already trying to navigate how to do business in the United States, especially if you're not from here, that becomes really really challenging. I think there's that. Um, I also just think um, there, the help didn't come fast enough, right? Like restaurants aren't businesses that sit with a ton of capital. That's just not how we work. I mean, it's you have as much as you can possibly, you small know. Small margins too, small obviously. Small margins, yeah. So when it doesn't come fast. I hate to interrupt. What is happy this Happy to thing? tiramisu nachos. Oh my God. So again. I have to pick man, that up or I use me? a fork? What do you do with no, that? No, just pick it up like nachos. Okay, so they're do, just okay. like little, um, there's tiramisu a. Tiramisu There's a cocoa cream. There's some caramel in there. There's a cookie crunch. And Go ahead, do something. Chocolate crunch. <laughs> a little bit of chocolate syrup. Oh, my syrup. God. Um, what I've learned is that tiramisu is very hard to do straight up because no matter how good it is, you're competing with that time that I was like with my wife and it was perfect. Do you have a and diet? What's, why are you not doing it? You're on a diet? Oh, I'm yeah, what's not. Going on, Kim? <laughs> okay, fine. I'm not on a diet. What's but going on, Kim? Come on, I still broccoli my teeth, Jim. I mean, you know, it's like I want to be able to converse and not embarrass myself. Can I add? Uh, uh, well, it's too late for that. <laughs> yeah, I was say, we're so, here now. <laughs> can I add on? A, you know, one of the things that's most impressed me in the middle of this pandemic, the level that people like you, including you, have elevated your charitable work to is unbelievable. You're hanging by a thread through this nightmare. Mm -hmm. I talked to you and Ming Tsai right before you did that million dollar dinner to benefit Jose Andres in the World Central Kitchen, mm -hmm. obviously in Ukraine. You were all over every LGBTQ cause mm -hmm. ever. You won some national competition on television. You gave all the money to Susan G. Komen uh, of breast cancer. What is yeah. the, I mean, this is talk about a softball to end this. What's the thing with restaurateurs who, who seem to spend so much energy helping other people when they need help themselves. We don't exist without our communities. Period. End of story. Like if, if so, it's our, selfish at the same time you're being selfless. No, I don't. Think I don't it's, mean that in a crass yeah, way. Yeah, I, I know. I know you don't. But I think it's. Um, I think we are naturally givers. We're people who, who inherently want to make people feel good. We yeah. want to take care of people. That is the core yeah. of what it's, we do. It's in our DNA. I mean, yeah. Every restaurant person, anyone in hospitality, wants to take care of people, mm -hmm. and it's in our DNA that you know even if. Whatever, I mean, the old grandma making food for, you know, the sick uh, kid, mm. whatever. I mean, it's just the, yeah. our way of taking care of people is feeding them. And it's also, we're lucky enough that people will spend a ton of money to be able to raise money mm. for these charities. Mm -hmm. So the good news is we're done so you can get the broccoli out of your teeth. Ken Oranger, <laughs> Faccia al Faccia, <laughs> Tiffany Faison, Tenderonis and tons more. Congratulations, Thank Merry you. Christmas. And I hope Thank both you. your places Happy do great. Holidays. They are great. Holidays. Great to see you both. That's it for tonight. Please come back tomorrow when I'm joined by former Massachusetts Senator turned U.S. Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry, on the breakthroughs that came out of the latest Global Climate Conference and the long road still ahead. That more tomorrow at 7. Thank you for watching, and please don't forget Ukraine. Christmas.